the last two weeks, Nathan Dimmock was talking about being created in the image of God and that he's given us authority. Jesus says, I have all authority, therefore go. So he took his authority and he gave us, the, he delegated the authority that he had and he told us to go. And when, if we look back in Genesis, we're supposed to take dominion over the land and all the creatures, okay? So he's given us authority. Um, now, I'm gonna to go to Matthew 10, if you would. This is something that uh, Nathan mentioned, I think, in church last week. Matthew chapter 10. Verse 5. Jesus sent them out and commanded them. He what to them? What did he do to them? Commanded them. Okay? He vocalized it. He spoke with power. He commanded them, do not go in the, he sent them out, and he says, go to the, where he told them where to go, preach, as you go saying, preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He told them what to do, and what are they supposed to do about this kingdom of heaven? What are they supposed to do? Preach. Preach. They're supposed to be speaking, they're vocalizing it. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. And usually you don't do it in sign language, you speak. Uh, freely you have received, freely give. So he gave him a command, he spoke, he gave him authority, he gave him power. Now, the reason why I'm going to be talking about this, the title of this is Life and Death are in the Power of the Tongue. You as adults will be held accountable not just by God. He says that we're going to be, we're going to go to the scripture later, it's Matthew chapter 12, but he says that we're going to be held accountable for every idle word every idle word but the thing is in life in in civil society if you want to use that term that you are being held accountable for things that you say or commit to oaths vows things like that so we're going to find out in this series we're going to find out what god has real revealed to us about oaths in the bible we're going to see that um uh, how the things that he's revealed in the bible are actually playing themselves out continually today the things that he spoke, the things that he instituted, creation, all of creation continues as he made it uh, subject to the fall, to the uh, to things going from order to chaos because of the sin of, of Adam and Eve. But what we're going to see is how this stuff plays out in society because it's going to matter to you. And I'm going to ask you a few questions here to see how much experience you've had in this. We're also going to see how God's word, is, as I kind of mentioned before, is being has been corrupted how these, these principles of God's law and his word, how they're playing out law and society, how it's being corrupted in postmodern society. Now, here's the benefit to you. Why are you benefiting from this? Um, my goal is that when you're considering things that you're going to do or say, that you're going to consider it based on the power of God, the spirit of God. We're going to be citing some things in the Old Testament which are law, but it's not really law. What it is is when God speaks and he's instituted things uh, in, in, in this world that we've take, that he's given us dominion over, there's things that we do, principles that we get out of his word that we apply by faith, and it's power. It's, it's, uh, it's a good thing. It's a, it it uh, establishes his kingdom right where we are when we do those things that he's promised or given us instruction to do in scripture. So also in society, you're going to be given situations where you're going to be considering whether you're going to give an oath, and you're going to be able to, I think, better evaluate what kind of oath you're going to give or if you're going to give an oath at all. All right? So it's going to have some practical applications. Now, we're going to go into the question period. And Mariah, I may pick on you, but I'm not going to do it right now. I'm just going to ask. Yeah, I'm going to, I don't know, I might. What's an oath? Explain oath. It's like a verbal agreement to do something. Verbal agreement to do something. Oath. Okay. Is it, is it merely an agreement? Ooh, is it, ah. The word agreement actually has meaning in law. And an agreement is not a contract. And there's things you can do in an agreement that you can't do in a contract. A little trivia. And oaths, and it plays a part of these principles of oaths and vows. So it's very good. So it's an agreement. Now an oath, we're gonna see something in the scripture is something that has uh, a little bit of a, a spiritual bigger dimension to it that there's 
an interesting accountability that comes in when you give a oath. So now where do we find oaths? This is for everybody. Where do we find oaths? Where you require to ask to give an oath? Court. Court? Where else? In the military. Military? It's a president. President? Taking office? Okay. Now why, why are you, okay, court? Why are you asked in a court to so give an oath? Lie. So you won't lie? Yeah. So basically saying you're accountable one to God. Okay. And do you know why that's required in court? You don't know, actually. You don't know that. You in the next couple of weeks you're gonna you're gonna learn something you didn't know before. Alright, sounds good. Okay. <laughs> so it's the difference between an oath and under a penalty of perjury signature. Oath. All, all these things are based on the scripture. Okay. So what's your what do you think military? Why are you giving a, a oath to the military? Because you're supposed to be serving and protecting your country. Ah. You're kind of saying I'm not gonna to the other side. Ah, so there's an allegiance yeah. issue there. So that's pretty important. Like you say, the Pledge of Allegiance. Yes. I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I will bear true faith and allegiance. Same. I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me according to the regulation, Uniform Code of Military Justice, who help me God. <laughs> sort of like that. <laughs> but how many people actually can rattle that off? Not very many. And I, I did it one time. I actually re-enlisted here in the church. And what it was, it's an oath. And I'm not going to repeat after me. If I'm going to say it, I better say it. Better man up and say it. So I said, I will. And you know what? I'm stuck. Even if they don't pay me. So I've given an oath against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Oh my goodness, I'm stuck. I've given an oath. I'd be betraying God if I step back on it right now. Now there is a little aspect of it. There is a status thing, the orders of the President of the United States, when you're in the status of the military, that applies. But because of the Constitution, and supporting and defend the Constitution as a higher authority, then because of my status not being in the military, now I have to step back out of that and then hold the President accountable to the Constitution as not a being the military instead. So there's these you know, principles that they're actually scriptural. Okay, the other thing that you said was we had courts, we had military, and what president. was it? President. And his is a similar, it's very similar. And his oath is to the Constitution. It's not to the people, and it's before God. So, who ultimately holds him accountable for his behavior? The president, him or her? Who is it that holds him accountable? The no, God. God. <laughs> God. So he's not accountable to Congress. He's not accountable to the people. He's not accountable to the courts. And so, in fact, there's a principle in law that, that even because of his oath, he could tell the Supreme Court, no way, you guys aren't obeying the Constitution. No way, Congress, I'm not going to execute that because it isn't law. I'm supposed to faithfully execute the law, but it's according to the Constitution. And what you've done is not lawful. Because my oath before God, I cannot in good conscience execute that which you have put as the color of law. So these are biblical principles. Everything is everything in society, everything that we're existing, government even is a minister of God for our good. It's all a matter of faith. It's all a matter of conforming to the authority of Jesus Christ. Now, let's go ahead. All right. I have some other questions here. Uh, are you required to make an oath? In what situations would you be required to make, give an oath? Would be uh, all three of the ones we mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. <clears throat> well, I guess you deny it in court, but not nah, good. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could deny it, but I don't. And they and they they may not have the ability to deny you that, but they would. We'll see. <laughs> okay, that's a good question, isn't it? It's does they may, is there a place where you're required to give an oath? Uh, what are the consequences? What are the alternatives? What does the scripture say? Are oath a requirement? Are they even permissible? So that's where we're going. That's your intro. Now you can look at your handout, because that's what I'm going to do. Oaths and vows. Jesus says, again, you have heard that a set of those, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. Now this is one section that Jesus is quoting the Old Testament. We're actually going to go to the Old Testament and, and see this law. That's law. It's actually a principle of, of God's kingdom 
depending on where you're standing in it, whether you have faith to do his plan or you've got some other plan you've got and he's just giving you some mechanism for survival. In the New King James Bible that I use, publisher's caption before this verse that we're going to read next, it says, Jesus forbids oaths. So that says it's not quoting the Bible. It's coming up with its own conclusion. Jesus forbids oath. Does this statement from Jesus support that caption? I need somebody to read it. Just the one above? No, one below. The one oh. uh, next, 33 through 36 or 7, whatever it is. And you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. So... Is it, and again, what's it appear? Is it appear that Jesus is forbidding an oath? What, is there a different word other than forbid? What do you think? I don't think it's necessarily forbid. I think he just wants you to be, uh, people to be able to believe you when you just say yes or no. Okay. It's almost like he took it to the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. Okay. Yeah. Good. So let's basically speak truth all the time. Don't like, Never like, have anyone okay, question I, you. Right, I'm telling the truth now. Yeah. You notice that lawyers don't take oaths. Maybe you'll notice that yeah. lawyers don't take oaths when they start to speak. And they will speak non-truths in front of you. And you're supposed to procedurally stop them. Uh, here's, here's a, is this a new thing? Is he introducing a new concept? Because look at the first part that I set up there, Matthew 5.33. You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. Now, is this a new thing? He said, no, don't do it. Don't swear at all. Is he contra or con Do you know, is he contradicting the Old Testament with this statement? Well, we're going to see, because everybody doesn't know, right? Let's go ahead and, and look down at the scripture. This, the next section I want to show you is there is a precedent of oaths. It turns out we've been created in the image of God. We're given the same authority. Well, same, I guess. You know, whatever authority he's given us in scripture... It's there. Whatever's there in Scripture, that's what he's, he's endowed to us. He's, he's delegated some authority to us, uh, bound by what we can see in Scripture, what's revealed in Scripture. But let's see what the Lord does. The Lord gives oaths. The Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land. I will be with you and bless you. For you and your descendants I will give all these lands. I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I don't even, yes, Genesis 26. So he's talking to, uh, I believe, Jacob here. But he's, he's reminding us in Scripture that he has given an oath to Abraham, to the promised land, and to bless him, and to make him a great nation. And it says here in Scripture that he swore an oath. Let's look down to the next verse. And I'm, I can't think, yeah, it's Genesis 26. So the next one is Numbers, uh, verses 32. The Lord's anger was roused that day. He swore an oath, saying... And now he, he promises that those who are 20 years old and above won't enter the promised land. And he swears an oath. Let's look at the next scripture, Deuteronomy 7, 8. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand, redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh. He swore an oath. Let's go to the next one, Deuteronomy 29. Uh, that you may enter into the covenant with your Lord and into his oath which the Lord gives you today. And just as he has sworn to your fathers. Let's go to the next page. Flip it over. Ezekiel chapter 36, 7. I've raised my hand in an oath that the nations around you shall bear their own shame. God swears an oath. The creator of heaven and earth, the one who we've been made in his image, he's given us certain authority and delegated to it. He swore an oath. Next one. Ezekiel 44, 12. Therefore, I've raised my hand in an oath against him, says the Lord. Let's go to 47, 14. Uh, I raised my hand in an oath to give it to your fathers. This land shall fall to you as your inheritance. The next one, Daniel 9.11. Uh, Therefore the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against them, because he gave them promises. He swore an oath that he would bless them conditionally. Some blessings are unconditional. Some he promised as an oath, unconditional. Some things were you reap what you sow. 
you know, there's things that are going to come against you. We swore an oath. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham was cited in Luke chapter 1. In Acts, therefore being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, talking about Abraham, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He swore an oath. So our Heavenly Father swears an oath. So I can look at that and say, swearing an oath, as I'm wondering about whether I should swear an oath, if the judge asks you, should you swear an oath? I can at least look at Scripture and say, well, my Heavenly Father swore oaths. Okay? Now, it doesn't sell everything. I mean, you've got to look at the whole of Scripture and, the, and what's being put before you. But I know that my Heavenly Father has swore, swore an oath. Okay? Now, let's look at Scripture. What's the procedure? So somebody read Deuteronomy chapter uh, 6, verses 10 through 15. Thanks, somebody. Who? Anybody? All right. Okay. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of all good things which you did not fill, hewn out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, when you have eaten and are full, then beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of fathers. Now stop. He is just explaining he has fulfilled his oath. He swore an oath. He's fulfilled it. Be careful. So go ahead. And these are some admonitions. Keep going. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him, and shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. Notice the underlying thing I put there. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him, and shall take oaths in his name. And I think the point here is, and if you look through other scriptures that talk about these oaths, it's in his name. It's restricted. When you swear an oath, do it in the Lord's name. Now that seems to some like blasphemy. Oh, you're using the Lord's name in vain. No, hopefully you're not using it in vain. He said, I want you to use, take your oaths in my name. So who are we accountable to? God. God. Let's go to the next scripture. You shall fear the Lord your God and shall serve him, and to him you shall hold fast and take oaths in his name. There's the emphasis, in his name. Jesus was raising this and saying, hey, it's said in Scripture that you're supposed to swear your oaths in his name. So you guys feel pretty confident, pretty holy about doing all these wonderful oaths you're taking in his name. He says, but I have a better way. Now what I want to see is whether Jesus' better way was a new thing. It turns out it's not a new thing. So, Deuteronomy 23. It's right there on the sheet. Right. Verses 21 through 23 there. When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you should not delay to pay it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and it would be sin to you. But if you abstain from vowing it, shall be not sin. Wait, yeah, forgot to get there. Yeah. It shall not be sin to you. That which has gone from your lips, you shall keep and perform. For you voluntarily vow to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. So it's not a new thing. Even in this, in the promise of God from the beginning, when referring to vows, he says, okay, now if you make your vow to the Lord, don't delay, because I'm going to hold you accountable. It's strict accountability. And the, notice it says here, Lord, it will be sin for you if you speak it. But if you abstain from vowing, it shall not be sin for you. If so there's a voluntariness here. Are, vow, are there anywhere in anything that you're required to make a vow, required to make an oath, that you can be compelled to make an oath? No. There's nowhere in law that I know, spend a little bit of time reading it for thousands of hours, but it didn't make me a total expert, but I've sought this thing, and there's nowhere that you can be compelled to take an oath. Now they can come, they can, ask you where you're going to sign up for selective service whether or not they can condition things on it, that's a question of law that hasn't been resolved but they can't require you to take an oath so somebody says well you're going to have to serve in the military now raise your right hand no what do you mean no you're going to serve in the, if you don't serve in the military we're going to put you in prison well you know there may be a defense here in law well that may happen to you you say, well, I just can't in good conscience 
give an oath to uh, give allegiance to anything other than God. Whatever, whatever your motivation is to say, I can't swear that oath. Well, guess what? There may be temporal consequences. They may be wrong. But they're also in law as a thing. Why? Well, because that would be a sin for me. What do you mean sin? It turns out in law, it's preserved that you could go to scripture and say, look, God has said, do not give an oath because it's going to be sin for me if, if I do this, if, I, if it's something that I can't fulfill. And I'll be, you know what I mean? For whatever reason, you could say that it says here that it says right here, it says, if you abstain from vowing, it shall not be sin for you. So I'm trying to avoid sin. That's it. It's, it's a matter of, of faith. So it's possible that you could be, depending on your confession, is it really true, is this just a political preference, or is this really a conscious thing that you're actually, like, accepted from the requirement? Oh, okay. Okay, we can't use you. Would you like to be a chaplain? We've got a little waiver here. Chaplains don't have to give an oath. I don't know. They may have some procedure. I have no idea. I have no idea. But because the authority of God's word is not discounted, the authority of God's word actually plays its part in every aspect of our lives. So if you're going to go to a courtroom, we'll be talking about this in a different week, and you say, well, I can't give an oath. Well, there's a consequence. We can talk about that. You may not be accepted as a witness because, and we'll have to talk about that. Wait, come back and see what the principles are that come out of God's word. So basically it says here, when you make your vow, the Lord will require it will be sin for you. But if you abstain from vowing, it shall not be sin for you. So my wife asked me today, will you be there on Wednesday night? And I went, I don't want to say it. I don't want to. I, I don't think, I don't know if I'm supposed to. But if I make a vow, because I just did my homework on this lesson, I'm stuck. And then it will be sin for me. So guess what? I, I deferred the question. But if you abstain from now, it shall, vowing it shall not be sin to you. That which is gone from your lips, you shall keep and perform. Now that's the point that I want us, you guys to consider here. That which is gone from your lips, you shall keep and perform. That which comes out of your lips, you shall keep and perform. God said, let there be light. And the Lord, uh, so everything, even in creation, we go back to Genesis 1, God speaks and God said, let there be light. It came out of his lips. He was accountable to himself that light would show up. Okay, when you speak with your mouth, I think that there's something that we don't realize there's a value and authority and power when we speak. Speak to the rock, God says to Moses. Yeah, one time he told me to hit with stick. But there's, there's things that happen that I think we don't realize how important it is for us in that authority delegated to us that we're actually, by faith, speaking that which is true with authority. So, and I think we're going to see it apply in a whole bunch of what, a whole bunch of ways. That which is gone from your lips shall, shall keep and perform, for you voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. Now, what are what are kind of oaths you make? You make oaths in the courtroom to do what? Pretty much tell the truth. To tell the truth. My, I'm accountable to God to speak the truth. That's. Be, we're going to talk about that specifically on a different week. Okay, joining the military. Is it, you can't compel somebody. You can kind of put a little coercion, a little coercive influence on the situation to have somebody serve in the military. But those who have a conscience before God that they can't do that, they can't make war, you know, it would be sin for them. They have provisions to make them not take that out, to not serve some alternative. Um, uh, president of the United States. You can't be president, there are consequences. You can't be president of the United States if you will not swear an oath, which is an oath of allegiance and a, an oath before God that you're accountable for your actions. What are other places you make oaths and battles? Well, um, I kind of, this is sort of a question. Okay. Um, you might get into this at some point in the series, so now might not be the time, but um, when we're talking covenants as well, like a marriage covenant, and I mean, a covenant, there's oaths involved in covenant. Like all, most of these verses here are referring to the oath that God gave to Abraham, which was actually part of a covenant. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, I guess, covenants are more of a two-way 
two-way thing many times that you both have a part that you have to uphold or, um, but I guess is that similar and if so then in, in the marriage there's an oath and there are consequences if you're not willing to do that because then it's no longer a covenant relationship but okay. I guess that's more of a question of the similarity between oaths and covenants. It's a good question. There is a marriage was instituted was revealed in scripture that marriage um, the father, man shall leave his father, mother be joined to his wife, the two shall become one flesh. Jesus went on to pronounce and explain that who God has joined together, let no man separate. So that there's actually even something bigger than that, okay? That there's instituted from the very beginning is the order of creation, that marriage uh, fidelity as being the perfect order, his plan. So even beyond our plans that instituted uh, mechanism that God has is, is kind of got more power than, than our words can touch. But what we do, if you look at that, if you look at the marriage vows, that is an institute that we have created as man. Okay, say, perform your vows. It's been a tradition that we have a vow uh, related to the wedding ceremony. And it is, it's, Jesus said, before two or more witnesses, let every word be established. He was, he was um, that shows up in the Old Testament where you're talking about holding somebody accountable for a crime. Before two or more witnesses, speaking with their mouth, or if you don't have two or more witnesses, a person could not be held accountable for the crime. Okay? Rather than go free and be accountable to God on judgment day, than to us risk having somebody who's innocent be punished here on earth. We don't have the authority to do it. So coming back to this, it's an institution that we've created as a tradition so that people will voluntarily know this is a voluntary thing and then they're accountable to God for what they speak. And, that, and I think it's the vow that we make in marriage is insanely important. And I think we need to probably revisit vows and really make sure that people communicate what they would vow with each other. You know what I mean? So we see... Um, I guess it adds a whole new element to, you know, when a marriage is broken, um, you see the consequences of that just ripple out because not only are they breaking a covenant with each other through their vows, like they're not just breaking the oath that they made to each other through mm -hmm. their verbal, through the power that God has given us mm -hmm. in our verbal agreement, but also in breaking what God from the very beginning designated as being a perfect image of him right. together. And so it's kind of a two-way, like a double whammy. Because yeah, this is two, a double whammy. You have two aspects of complete power that God gave yes. in breaking that. So all That's of a sudden, right. the consequences are just twice as huge. Yes. And you know what? The marriage covenant and, and God's plan and, God, and the consequences are there notwithstanding a vow. Yeah. Now, you know, find yourself on a deserted island together. It's like, hey, you know, we're here. We're married, you know, whatever it is. Once a, you know, okay, I'll just leave that alone. But the, uh, the, uh, but yeah, yes, yes, it is. Because, and your, what your words are have power and you're stuck. And it's not just the consequences. I think what you were pointing out or what you were touching on, it's not just that, oh, okay, I messed up. Now God's going to like decrease my real estate in heaven. No, your words have power. So you're breaking, a, what you want to term it, a covenant. You're breaking a vow. It's not a contract. If you're stuck, you've changed your status. You're stuck with what you've confessed. You can't back out on it. You're, you're always accountable to that vow. So that's the principle that I see in Scripture. It said, you shall, when you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it, for the Lord will surely require it of you, and it would be sin to you, just as the Lord, this term, the Lord will require it of you, is a term he used in Deuteronomy when he's promising Jesus, this prophet that will come, whoever does not hear him, the Lord will require it of him. That's some pretty significant judgment. Okay? That which is gone from your lips, you shall keep and perform, for you voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. Now, how does this apply? In, we know now, we can see revealed in Scripture, that oaths are a big, holy, powerful thing. The creator of the universe uses oaths. And they're very powerful. And he sticks himself with them. And then so we should be able to predict what we should see. Because he's sworn an oath. 
And so that means it is okay to swear an oath. It has authority. It has biblical principle, right? We can see how it works. But we know even when it was instituted and, and revealed in the Old Testament that it's not something you should do lightly. In fact, it's encouraged even in the Old Testament to not do it. Isn't that something? He encourages us. We're human and we do have trouble sticking to it. Exactly. <laughs> We're not God. Because once you say it, you're stuck with it yeah. forever. Right. Are you sure Unless you Unless you this? gave an oath with a time limit. I don't know. I don't know if you well, can even do that. <laughs> we're going to have, sometimes we talk about this, we're going to talk about rash vows. And what do you do about it? Where do we see rash vows in Scripture? And is there a provision for it? What do you do after a rash vow? Hmm. Yes. God has like, grace I'll for I'll sacrifice things. that which comes out of the door. Yes. Pretty rash vow. Yeah. And we'll actually talk about the remedy <laughs> for those things other than uh, shedding yes. innocent blood. Okay. So the practical application is going to court. Do you give an oath? Do you swear an oath? Are you required to? Well, I'd like you guys to come back, and hopefully there'll be more people here, and I'll actually explain the principles behind oaths. I'm going to give you some examples. Modern-day example uh, came up in the news. Should the lady be allowed to give an oath or uh, testify in court with a veil on? She's Muslim. Hmm. Okay, well, the judge says no because... I can't see her facial expressions where I judge her honesty. Ooh. So we're going to leave that out there, and I'm going to base anything I say on Scripture. Okay? So this is, uh, and you notice you don't know which way I'm going with it. It's just, we don't know. I don't see what the Lord has revealed to us in Scripture. So that's it. Does anybody have any questions about oaths? Tate, oaths. Are you required... Anywhere that you're required to take an oath that you can think of? No. Not exactly. And there may be consequences. You may not become the President of the United States. <laughs> may not be able to testify in court. And there may be, and you may, but we'll have to talk about that. If I can get out of court, that would be nice. <laughs> well, as a witness. You may not be considered a credible witness. Do you have to do an oath? There's no oath required for a jury except just to say that you don't know that person. I don't know. I've never been on a jury, and I'll look it up before I come back. Yeah, that'd be interesting.